I'm going to be reading to you from the Epistle to the Hebrews, 11th chapter, verses 1 through 3. Amen? Amen. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Thus it's reading to our hearts of understanding. I'd like to say just a few words about the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, it's not the most easiest epistle. And as we read those three verses, we, we think we got it. We understand it. But if I were to ask, well, what did it just say? Do we really understand it? And that's what the, the need is, is to understand the scripture and what is being said. And this epistle was written somewhere around 65 AD, a few years ago. And at first they gave it to the Apostle Paul's authorship. Uh, and then uh, in about the 2nd century, 3rd century, uh, a biblical scholar by the name of Origen, uh, anyone who did any study knows that name, uh, he thought that uh, it didn't add up to Paul's kind of uh, religious outlook. But that it maybe was written by someone who was in his company, a follower of Paul's and even hinted that the epistle to the Hebrews was written by a female by the name of Priscilla. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. It's not down, but you can look at uh, Acts 18 or Romans 16 verses 3 and 5 and you'll see Priscilla name in there and that she was, was a, an important part of, uh, of the following of the Apostle Paul. So it says, faith is the solid certainty at that which we hope for, based upon reality and solid existence. So uh, our faith is strengthened by the ups and downs of the way we live, what we experience, what's happening in our own lives, what's happening in the world around us right now. So faith then is based on that which is tested and crucial. And what is it that is unseen, but is tested and crucial? Is it not the power of God interacting through the many events of history, which from time to time experiences were experiencing his almighty acts, blessing his people, the chosen people? Now the Christian people. But I think God also is trying to help all people and interacts with them through their lives and their experiences. The Bible says we have this wonderful cloud of witnesses. And if you read chapter 11, it'll give you more names than you can think of. And they're all familiar names. And it'll talk to you about how God interacted with them and how through faith they, they went and just did wonders. Such a great cloud of witnesses. You know the book of Revelation, uh, they thought it was written somewhere around uh, 100 to 110 AD. We know that the Gospel of John was the last of the four Gospels that was written, which again was from maybe from 90 to 100. And I wonder if, if the Bible was uh, up to date, how many, how many other names would be there to show the wonderful cloud of witnesses that God had called and, and through faith they, create, they were able to follow God's uh, teaching and God's guidance. And just think about how this country was formed and, and people who uh, sailed the ocean blue. I 
down to how many uh, ships never made it. And they, they came because they had faith that God, God was calling, that this was a land of milk and honey, maybe, that the Bible talks about. That this was a freedom area, that they could be free of uh, religious uh, intolerance. And they came. And they came. And if you looked at history, they came and they came and they came. What a blessing. What a cloud of witnesses. So when we talk about faith, and we say, well, I don't know about faith, read the Bible. Read about these people. It's there. And you know that it's there because they're not names picked out of a hat. If we were to go and skip to uh, Hebrews 12, it reads, Therefore we are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. So if you want to know where that is, it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hebrews 11 tells us all, all these people who are part of the cloud of witnesses. The Bible's faith is not blind optimism. It's not some hope for some feelings that we have. It's not an intellectual assent to some doctrine that is being taught. It's true biblical faith is confident obedience in God Almighty and His Word. Inspired by the circumstances and the consequences by which we get involved. Oh yeah, we learn from our mistakes. It's not just from good things. We make mistakes, we all make mistakes. All fall short of the glory of God. But you're supposed to learn from them. And those who are wise, learn from them. And God blesses them with strong faith. Ability to redeem themselves. You are redeemed through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But redemption comes when you want to make something different out of your life. And, and you want to put an end to some of the sorrows and, and, and some of the injustices that, that we see around us. And, and you just want to know, how am I going to do that? You, you, you're going to do it by facing it. You're going to do it by uh, offering yourselves in, in some way. And, and when it comes down to talk, talk is cheap. You talk what's in your heart. You don't worry about you know, hurting somebody's feelings. They're telling you what they feel, you tell them what you feel, and isn't that the way it's supposed to be? And if we disagree, we disagree, but uh, at least we share our thoughts. And the people that we witness to can be maybe uplifted in spirit, be helped. Chapter 11 is just a, a wonderful, wonderful chapter. True biblical faith is that confident obedience in God in his word, inspired by circumstances and consequences. So faith operates quite simply like this. God speaks, and we hear. And those who have faith take the word of God, and they live their lives. And they move out in faith. There's, there's many a time when I'm sure we are uh, in doubt of what decisions to make in our lives and we get to a point where we're praying and we're hoping and, and we've got to make that decision. And you might say, well, I really feel God is telling me to do this. So you do it. And sometimes uh, there are some negative experiences, but every experience is a blessing because God is with you. Jesus says, I'm always with you. I will not leave you. God speaks and we hear and we do what God's word says. And basically it's to love God and be obedient and to love neighbor as ourselves. It's, it just comes back and back and back. Don't forget God speaks to us through the scriptures, but he also speaks to us through nature. He also speaks to us through our thinking. He also speaks to us on all the experiences. Sometimes circumstances may seem impossible and the consequences are frightening and unknown, just as we're going through today. 
between the virus and the things that are happening in the world. Yet we, through faith, come to God and we obey His word because we believe in Him. And what we believe in Him is that whatever He is doing is right, is best, and is just. Right, best, and just. That's been the story of faith in God during all these years of creation. Even the, even the times we don't know it. And sometimes we, we're part of it, we don't even know it. And, and sometimes we might lose a picture that God did something for us because we go, oh, I did that. I was strong. I'm, I'm glad I was strong. Then all of a sudden you think, oh, wait a minute, God was urging me on. God was uplifting my spirit. God was whispering in my ear. I am God. Be still, know that I am God. Be quiet. If you want to try to understand what this means, <clears throat> now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And I was thinking that if we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, the, be the beginning of Genesis, and chapter 1, verse 3, and here's what it says. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Verse 3. At that time, there was no moon, there was no sun, there were no stars. He said it, and it became a reality. And that's the way the universe was formed, by the word of God. This, this God is powerful. This God is almighty. This God is tremendous. And we lose out when we don't have faith. We lose out when we doubt the good God that gave us life and looks after us because he loves us and wants to save us and wants to lead us into that jubilant time of enjoying the life that we have. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and he saw that it was good. And he said, it's done now. So by faith we understand that the world was formed by the word of God. It is only by faith given by revelation in God, beyond the proof or disapproval of any person, nobody can prove to you that there's no, no God. If it's in your heart, it's been given to you because the way you were raised, it's been given to you because of the way you've experienced life, the blessings that have come your way. I have to say that uh, at 81 years old, there's never been a day that uh, I was out of work. I didn't go to college when I was young. I graduated high school, and for a month I was a bum. And my mother was in the hospital, and she said, you get a job today? <laughs> I said, you know, and I, I wasn't going to do this. She said, you know, the post office I hear is hiring. And she just looked at me. And said, so I went to the post office, and sure enough, they needed people. I got a job, and I went to the hospital. I said, guess what, Mom, I got a job. Never been out of work since. God has blessed, blessed me. God blesses us in so many ways. Count the ways and you'll be so happy. So my faith then is strengthened by my walk in this world, which is created by God, formed by God. Leaving in his word that it's for my journey. And it will be an enhancing of blessings upon me because I'm obedient to God's word. So faith then is like an energetic force. It's a, it's a power that rises us above any 
problem, any situation. Powers to uh, was a Superman to leap tall buildings of a single bound. I don't think I can do that. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> we should be moved by the love of gratitude that God has given us mercy. We've received forgiveness and providence to live our lives in a good way. In his compassion, he has forgiven us. I said last week about compassion. Compassion is to understand another person's pain and be empathetic for them. God is compassionate and empathetic for us. He wants us to experience the good life. And we're missing out daily. We're missing out daily. So I'm going to kind of jump over and, and shift gears a little bit. Because this is, to me, the most important part of the message. Chapter 12, verse 14, follow. This is in Hebrews. It reads this way. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will ever see the Lord. If you're not at peace with people, if you're not living in the holy way, this passage in Hebrew says we will never see the Lord. At least if we keep living that way. It continues, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, and many do, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. I want to speak about this. Does anyone fall short of the grace of God? This might mean one of two things or might mean both things. One, we fall short if we don't accept the forgiveness that God has given us for our sins. And sometimes people find it hard to forgive themselves. Jesus says, I forgive you your sins. I die for you on the cross. And the other part of that, we might put be there, is that we could fall short in granting the grace of forgiveness to someone else that has trespassed against us. We're unwilling to forgive. I hold a grudge. I never will be nice to them again. If you do not forgive the others that have sinned against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you for your sins. That's scripture. The Bible. And when we, we live that way, when we let anger and disappointment we get bitter with people. We make ourselves living in this prison, self-inflicted prison, that can do nothing good in our lives. And the more bitter we get, the more wider is the gap between us and the person that sinned against us. And the more bitter we are, the sicker we get. So that we get to a point where we're walking as, as they say, dead men walking. In fact, nothing is good anymore. Nothing makes me happy anymore. If you are truly seeking peace, but have not forgiven someone for their sin, well, they're apparent uh, sin. Sometimes we, we get to a point where we think someone said something or did something, and then we find out later that they never said that or did that. And, and we've carried this maybe for 
weeks or months or years. Not forgetting, not talking to them. Communicating, uh, you know, I feel bad here that you said this. Can we, can we get to that point to discuss on a one-to-one -one basis? When, when did you say that about me or when did you do that to me? It was hurtful. It was painful. And I'm very sad. You wonder why you can't experience peace. You're, you're, you're carrying bitterness. And God is, you, you're separating yourself from God. God is now with you but not able to help you because you've shut God out of your life. You've got to forgive as God forgives you. The only recourse is to have some therapeutic surgery of forgiveness that takes that bitterness, operates and removes that bitterness from your mind and your heart and your soul. And you know what? If you turn around and forgive somebody that you've been really nasty to and they know it, and you forgive them, you do wonders for that person. And it might be that that person all of a sudden becomes the best person in your life. And I've wasted all this time. Because I wouldn't forgive. And God says, forgive. You too. Let him who has not sinned throw the first stone. You might say, why are you, why are you doing so much? Just because it's all over. All the people I've ever visited that had problems in families, it was because of stuff like this. Unforgiving, bitterness, separation. God wants you to live fully with the blessings that he has for you. It's time to forgive. It's time to surgically remove that bitterness. And you're going to feel wonderful. And you're going to say, why didn't I do it a long, long time ago? Many, many years ago, there was a fellow who came in the post office. I was young and uh, he was young. And it just seemed like he, he didn't like me. He was always a uh, if I said something, he would say the opposite. And it got to a point where you really, you know, didn't like to really be around that person. And then the, the Cuban invasion came and we had to go for physicals. And lo and behold, he's gone for a physical. And I, and I went up to his name was Bill. I said, Bill, I hear you're going for your physical. He said, yeah. I said, so am I. You want to go with me? And we went together. And all of a sudden there was, there was no animosity, there was no anger, there was no, nothing in between our relationship. And I felt good about that at that moment. And then I found out that uh, I, I was unaccepted, that he was accepted, and he got on a plane that crashed, and he died. And I was, I was, I was sorry that he died, really sorry. And for all the 90 men on that plane. But I was uh, thankful I had asked him, could we go together? It's that easy. Break the bar that imprisons you. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, who son Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you always for being ready to forgive us our sins, wanting us to come back, the watching Father, the prodigal Son, coming back, seeking forgiveness, a chance for new life, opportunity to be free again. Great God of compassion, let us learn to love thee in Jesus our Lord to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let us repent of doing evil 
and resolve to follow Jesus and all the good that we can do by following him. Grant us the compassion to bless others, to forgive them, to help them, to care about them, to pray for them. And that's truly faith and action. Gracious God, continue to love us. Forgive us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.